Hey there again, everybody. This is Brad Reed with the Inside Creative Writing Podcast here with another real-time revision. And thank you so, so much to uh, the members of the Patreon team for supporting the show, for supporting me. And uh, I'm really having fun bringing you these real-time revisions. So I hope you're finding some value in those. Uh, we have a few new Patreon uh, team members this week. So I wanted to just take a minute and explain these real-time revisions just a little bit. So these are not nearly as produced or as formal as the podcast. This is really the behind the scenes of me working with my own uh, work in progress, which as you can see up here is called Crossing Cascadia. Uh, so this is just kind of a weekly check-in on how I'm using the tools, the techniques from the podcast in my own writing so that you can see kind of where the rubber meets the road. So because these are a little less form formal, they're not scripted at all. Um, I don't do quite as much uh, um, preparation of the sound studio. So occasionally you'll hear some background noises, including possibly my daughter's dog, Tug, who uh, is staying with us for the summer and is my little writing buddy during the days. So um, anyway, if you hear some of those little uh, uh, sounds and things, that's just because we're a little less formal. This, uh, I like to picture these as, as you and I just kind of sitting down together, talking about writing, the reality of what it looks like. And this week, I'm going to do something a little bit different uh, with this real-time revision uh, because I'm kind of in a strange place with uh, this um, revision of my rough draft. Now, I'm always reading something. In fact, I'm always reading at least two books. I'm always reading a book that I want to either learn structure or style or something from. So um, I think ab about that as my reading like a writer book. So I'm reading just a piece of fiction or something that I'm interested in. Um, and not just experience, not only just experiencing, but also learning the craft through looking at the final product. But I'm also always reading some kind of about writing book, some book that is going to teach me more about writing. And I've done this for so long that what I'm beginning to discover is that it's very rare for me to find a truly new concept or a new technique in a, an about writing book. But what I do find is uh, much of the same information that's presented in unique or differing ways. And as a school teacher, um, I understand how valuable this is. I don't know how many times I could sit down with a kid and explain something um, three or four times the same way and they don't get it. And as soon as I think of a different angle on it and I explain it in a new way, suddenly that light turns on, suddenly they get it. And we're no different, right? So I can learn about all of these different techniques in a lot of, uh, uh, over and over again, and as I hear different nuances of how they're taught, I learn them differently, or I understand them differently, which means that I apply them differently. And uh, that process has led me to what I wanna look at in today's real-time revision. I just finished, actually I have just a few pages left, but I'm almost finished reading uh, Sean Coyne's book, The Story Grid. Now this book, if you haven't read it, it really applies to my kind of nerdy writer side where I love to be able to take stories apart and examine how they work and how they're put together so that they have this emotional impact and so that they feel like stories. So a lot of what was in this book wasn't new to me. In fact, I'm not sure any of it was actually new to me as a writer, but what it did do is give me a different context or a different paradigm to look at these things through. And so what I've done, what I've been working on this week is it feel felt at first like a step back from the kind of revision that I was doing because I was really into, as you, as you know, if you followed these, I was in kind of that sentence by sentence, word by word revision. And I've had this nagging feeling for a while that I was I had gotten to that point too quickly with this book, right? That I had too much confidence, I guess you could say, in my rough draft, and I was jumping too fast into um, line by line, word for word editing, and I knew that there were some story issues, and I had convinced myself I could figure those out, I could work those out as I am revising, and Sean Coyne's book was a great reminder to not miss that step after rough drafting, where we kind of take off the writer hat for a little while and we put on the editor hat and we really examine how is this rough draft working or not working? What needs to be tweaked before we get to that level of word for word editing? So what I've done this week is played with the story grid. So if you have not read the story grid or maybe watched some of the videos, um, some of this is going to be a little um, jarring maybe because it's so 
Uh, it's such a deep dive into a story, but I am thrilled with the realizations about my story that I'm finding. And it's not even so much about the story. I'm still feeling very confident in the overall structure of my story because I did so much work leading up to it with outlining, with planning, and really knowing my story kind of backwards and forwards. What's really helping me with using the story grid is discovering scene by scene where those holes are, where those weaknesses are, and where I can strengthen those. So what I have up here on the screen right now is uh, scene six. Um, I've actually gone through one of the first things I did with working in through with the story grid is I went through and identified every scene of uh, my book so that I could look at it scene by scene. I've already kind of worked through scenes one through five. So I wanted to show you kind of what I'm doing here with scene six. So that's why I have this pulled up here. And scene six, I'm not going to read through it because it's a little bit longer scene. Um, but I want to just explain real quick so that you can see how I unpack this and look for these elements that should be in every scene of my story. And I'm kind of doing this real time, uh, therefore the real time revision, but I'm doing this real time so that you can see kind of how this process works. So um, I would normally read through this whole thing. I've actually done that prior to um, sitting down to record this because I didn't want to bore you with reading this uh, whole scene kind of out of context. But it is important we know what's happened here. So this is before the earthquake that kind of um, shakes up uh, Martha's life and leaves her scrambling through the wilderness to try to get back home. She's headed to a business meeting. So scene six is at the business meeting. And um, she's coming in feeling very, very insecure, very uncomfortable about herself. So she doesn't feel like she belongs or deserves to be there. She doesn't feel like she has too much to add. Um, she's coming from a very different background than everybody else there who's grown up kind of in the regular uh, secular culture um, in the business world. And she's coming from a very overly religious kind of fundamentalist um, culture where she's never had any exposure to business at all. So she's feeling very, very fish out of water here. Uh, but this moment comes, and again, I'm not going to read it all, but this moment comes where she's overhearing this team of uh, executives talk about a problem that they're having and they don't know how to solve it. And she has this moment of insight that actually comes from her religious background. It's from a Bible story that she remembers and thinks, oh my gosh, this is actually uh, applicable here. And so she ultimately gets up the courage to tell this story in the middle of this business meeting. Um, and uh, the scene kind of ends with her not knowing how that landed Um and uh, so that's that's essentially the scene that we have here. And that's enough for us to know to go ahead and look at the way the story grid works. So um, I've, I'm kind of jumping ahead to a further moment, but I want to show you real quick here what they call the fool's cap story grid. Um, it's, it, there's another name for that, but uh, this is close enough for you to find information on it. And this is basically step one is you're going to go through and you're going to outline the big elements of your story. What are the genres? Uh, what are the values that are at stake? What scenes does your genre kind of require that you have within your story? What point of view are you going to write it from? All of this stuff. And then basically he breaks it down. Sean Coyne does to the beginning hook, the middle build and the ending payoff. You'll recognize that as act one, act two and act three. So just a little different language there. And then I've broken down here the major events for each of those acts. So that's all done prior to this real detail work that I'm going to show you now. And this is a massive spreadsheet is what I'm working on here. If I can scroll over, you can see that there's actually a lot of information that I'm going through scene by scene to explore about my rough draft to see where it's working, where it's not. So I'm just going to walk you through this super quick so that you can see what I'm doing here. So each scene, I've basically numbered the scene. I have uh, written down how many words are in each scene. And this, this was a lot more insightful than I thought it would be. Look at this word count. Scene four is 565 words. Scene five is 138, followed by scene six is 1,416. So imagine reading this book and how jarring and frustrating this would be to have these chapters so wildly different. Um, I know when I'm reading, I'm always a little bit thinking ahead of how much am I going to read, right? I just finished this chapter. Ah, that took me about 10 minutes. Do I have another 10 minutes? Sure. And I'll jump in and read another one. Can you imagine reading a 138 word chapter that would take you, I don't know, no time at all. 
and then thinking, yeah, I've got another two or three minutes to read another chapter, and suddenly you're into a 1,500 word chapter, you'd be frustrated, right? So um, even just a simple piece of information here was enough to provide me some valuable information that surely I would have found down the road um, as I was doing maybe a final edit, but how nice to see this information up front and know that I've got some balancing to do. So story event uh, for the scene I'm going to look at, I'm basically just writing down one simple sentence, what happens? Martha solves a problem at the business meeting. Uh, this is something that Sean Coyne doesn't do as part of the story grid, but I think this is such a piece of uh, valuable piece of information. I've included it on my, um, and this re relates back to the somebody wanted but so that we've talked about on a couple of different podcast shows and a couple of different real-time revisions. I just want to make sure I know clearly in my mind what my main character wants from this scene and what's standing in her way. So Martha wants to fit in in a world that she's unfamiliar with, but she's not experienced enough to do so. So there's what she wants. My somebody is Martha. She wants to fit in, but she doesn't have the experience to do it. And now is where we get into the real nitty gritty work here. And again, I've, I've modified this a little bit from Sean Coyne's story grid. He had, um, well, you can go look at it um, on your own if this interests you, but I've just broken some of these points out to what he calls the five commandments of scene which uh, actually makes a lot of sense to me, right? You want every scene to have an inciting incident or something that kind of kicks the scene off. You want a complication or a, what he calls a turning point where, uh oh, there's something we need to deal with now. Uh, crisis question. This is one of those things that I never really thought of in the way that Sean Coyne teaches it. And I found really, really valuable in looking at my scenes. And this is what question... Uh, what debate is the character going to have to deal with now that these complications have arisen? So these should always be um, f in the form of a question. Climax is basically what decision was made, right? If there's this question, what did the character decide to do? And then how did that work out, essentially? And then I'll get into some of these other things once we look at that. So I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. I'm going to do this too quickly, in fact. Um, this should be a pretty slow process of reading and rereading these scenes and really examining how these work. But I think doing this fairly quickly can uh, show you the advantage of this process. So uh, the inciting incident in this scene is basically that a problem arises that the executives can't solve. So there's the, the issue, right? She's sitting in a meeting. There's nothing really moving the meeting forward. And suddenly this problem comes up that has to be dealt with. Now, um, Sean goes into this idea. Is this a causal or a coincidence um, inciting event. I'm going to leave that for now because that gets a little bit into the weeds, although that is valuable to make that determination. I really just want to show you the value of making sure each of these scenes moves in this way. So the complication, right? How do, does this get complicated? So one of the complications is that Martha, um, Martha remembers a Bible story that might relate so there's one of the complications. Um, another complication is that the executives argue over possible um, solutions. Now, these I could probably go deeper than this. And like I said, I'm rushing this just a little bit. But this is enough to sketch out, is this scene moving and working. So a problem arises. This is complicated by the fact that they're arguing about it. So emotions are high, making it even more difficult for her to kind of step nervously into the situation. And then she remembers this Bible story that might relate and she's unsure whether it's appropriate to do that. So now we have the question, right? So we have the incident, we have how this is complicated. And the question she's really asking here is, um, do I tell them the story and risk looking like a um, crazy religious nut or do I keep quiet and miss the opportunity to help I was gonna say to help solve a problem but really what she's trying to do is show um, her I'm going to put viability. That's a little bit of a heavy word. Viability. Um, 
in the meeting. Now, like I said, this is uh, real time. So these are these could definitely go back and I will go back and fine tune this a little bit, but I'm trying to get at the heart of this, right? So here's the conundrum or the crisis. Um, do I, do I go ahead and say, hey, I, I just thought of this Bible story that might actually lead us to a solution. If she does that, are they going to look at her like, why, why are you talking about the Bible in the middle of this meeting? Or does she um, shut up and just kind of still stay in the background and not be taken seriously because she doesn't have anything to offer here? So uh, a crisis here, right? Um, so the climax is essentially what decision does she end up making? And her decision is she shares the Bible story. And now what is the fallout of that? The fallout is um, uh, many of the executives laugh. Um, uh, I'm going to put subtly mock her. And a lot of that's going to be very subtle, right? Eye rolls or something like that. I don't think they're going to come right out and say, you're stupid or you're a fanatic or anything like that. But there's got to be this moment of kind of, oh, geez, what is this lady talking about the Bible for? So many of the executives subtly mock her, but the boss sees um, relevance in her. Uh, relevance in the story and a possible solution. So many of the executives subly mock her, but the boss sees relevance. So now this is basically the scene, right? I've gotten, I've stepped out of all the dialogue. I've stepped out of all the, the, the word by word kind of choice of how I write this. And now I see the guts of what this scene is trying to do. And that's where we get into this value shift and polarity shift. So here, uh, this is really the essential question. Why we're doing all this work is does this scene matter? Does this scene do anything? Does it change anything in the story? And this I'm still working on um, kind of how this works um, most effectively, but I'm going to go ahead and give this a shot here just because we are kind of showing the warts and all behind this kind of work. So the value shift, I'm going to say that she starts out um, unsure of herself um, two, uh, so how does she end to, um, valued at least by the boss, right? Cause there's some other wars to be fought there. So what's the change? She starts out unsure of herself. She ends up feeling valued or feeling taken seriously. Um, and then this is just a, what they call a polarity shift. So does this shift, does this scene go from a negative to a positive, positive to a negative, negative to a double negative. In other words, is it, does it start bad and it gets worse or does it start positive, things are going well and it gets even better. And that's just represented with these plus to plus, plus to plus, minus to plus kind of things. So this one, she starts out negative because she's obviously feeling very um, self-conscious, but she takes a risk and at least with the boss, it pays off. So this scene moves, right? This tells me that I have a valid scene here, that this goes from a negative to a positive. I know some kind of change has happened in the scene. I know that something kicks off the scene, that there are complications, decisions, and results from that decision. So going through this process tells me that scene six at least fundamentally is working. Now I'm going to go back through as part of the revision process. And if I go up here, you'll see that I've done one of these in red. I, I got ahead of myself a little bit. Sean says, never, never, never go back and rewrite anything during this process, but I couldn't help myself. Um, but I put this in red, right? So this opening scene wasn't working at all. So the red is me kind of rewriting the nuts and bolts of that scene. So once I've done this for the whole story, then before I get into my actual draft and start getting back to that word for word um, revision, I'm going to rewrite that scene knowing how it's going to work. And even on a scene like this, that, that uh, the story grid tells me this does kind of work. Um, I'm still going to come back and make it work better, right? How can I make these stakes even higher? How can I complicate this even more? How could I create this inciting incident that's going to cause even more tension, right? How, do, how can I show her wrestling with this decision more? So in every one of these points, even though this is working, 
I've got an opportunity to make this work better. And this is what I'm loving about the story grid. And like I said, I knew all of these steps beforehand. I've been taught all of these uh, multiple times. I've read about them from a bunch of different um, authors and teachers. But there's value in continuing to learn the same information from different people because it's pitched in a little different way. And for whatever reason, this time it just clicked in a little different way. And I like this system of sketching out the bones of the scene. I'm going to do one more. I know this is going just a little bit long because I know this next scene is a piece of garbage, right? And I want to show you why it's a piece of garbage. Um, I'm going to jump back here just very quickly because we've done scene six. So we get to scene seven, and it's called In the Waiting Room with Candidates. And as I study this, essentially all that happens is they now send her out into the conference room where these two guys that need to be interviewed are sitting out there, and she, look how short the scene is, right? It's not, it's barely a page and a half. And um, all she does is she goes out there to um, essentially send these two people in for these quick interviews, right? And I, I honestly don't remember what I was trying to accomplish when I wrote this scene, but it's weird. Once you get it written and it's in there, it kind of solidifies and it gets harder to look at it objectively and say, no, the scene really isn't doing anything, even though it's short, right? It'd be really easy to say, ah, it's just page and a half. Who cares? Maybe it adds a little bit of information. But as soon as I throw it into the story grid, now I have to really look at it from an objective point of view. So uh, Martha sends in candidates to be interviewed. As soon as I get to the somebody wanted, but so, uh, so the somebody's Martha, what does she want? I have no idea, right? She's just there literally to send people in. So maybe she wants it to go well, but there's really nothing getting in the way unless the people are like angry. And that's kind of what I did with the scene, but it wasn't, it wasn't working clearly as a somebody wanted, but so, so I already know We've got some trouble in this scene. The inciting incident, um, the inciting incident kind of comes from the previous scene where she is told to send in the two men for interviews. Now I can see plainly when I type that out that this is a crappy inciting incident, right? Uh, she's basically taking an order here to do something that has no risk or anything to it. Is there a complication? If there is, um, it's that one of the men is angry about having to be there. So there's a little bit of a complication in that, you know, she's having to kind of deal with this guy's attitude. The crisis question. Um, this is really where the scene breaks down, right? Is there a crisis here? I could sort of force one in there. Um, you know, does she respond to the man in kind or does she take the higher road? So, you know, is she going to be angry right back to him and kind of pissy or is she going to tr still treat him nicely? This really isn't even in that scene that much. This is almost me reading into it and how I could rewrite that scene. Climax is essentially what decision does she make? She treats him nicely resolution he goes in to the meeting wow what a piece of crap scene right we can feel as we're sketching this out that this scene is going nowhere the scene does nothing so is there any value shift in here there's really not right so there's none she's not changed at all by this scene she doesn't come in in any particular way. I mean, she's coming in on a little bit of a high from being uh, taken seriously by her boss, um, but that doesn't affect the scene at all and nothing changes um, in that scene. So the polarity shift in that scene, um, there's no negative to positive. There's no anything, anything, right? So I just wrote not applicable. In other words, there's no change in this scene. So this tells me one of two things. One, I just need to delete this scene, right? It's not doing anything. It's wasting 337 words of time and space in this uh, novel. And it's giving my reader a chance to check out and be done with the story. Cause suddenly, ugh, even though it's only a page and a half, it just died right here and nothing is happening. Or maybe I need to go back and reimagine this scene, right? Maybe I can pump up this, um, this interaction where this man, um, 
you know, is much angrier about something. And now we really get to see her skill or lack of skill in calming him down. But even then, how does that relate to my main story? You know, I I don't know that it does. If I can find a way to do it, the scene might live in a very different way. But almost certainly, um, I've just saved myself and my reader 337 words of stuff they didn't need to know. So there's the story grid. Um, It's going to feel, if you try this, like getting into the weeds for sure. I'm going to spend probably the next few weeks at least just... um, tearing my story down into these small moments of each scene to make sure that each scene is at its strongest point and that each scene is doing work. Because if that's true, then my book is going to be strong, right? My story is going to be strong because the story is essentially the build up, the conglomeration of all these scenes working together. Now there's a, so much more to the story grid. Um, I'm not sure I've subscribed to it 100%, right? No, the advice I give, I hope you don't just take at face value 100%. Um, Every piece of advice, every technique, every strategy um, is about you finding the little things that work for you, um, taking those away with you and adding those to your writing life. So you can see how I've already started to do that in the way that I'm modifying this story grid for my own kind of style. So... This looks like something that would work for you. I really recommend that you check out the story grid. Uh, There's, if you can't afford the book or don't want to wait for the book to show up, um, there's a bunch of resources online. There's videos where he kind of walks you through quickly each of these steps. There's a bunch of free resources at the website. You could just Google the story grid. It's going to take you right there. Uh, But it's something that I encourage you to look into, even if you don't use any of it, even if you reject it as too too much planning, too intentional, um, you're going to learn something from it, right? At the very least, you're going to learn what what you don't <laughs> want to do. And there's some value in that as well. So anyway, I'm off to kind of a different direction in my revision for the next couple of weeks as I take a step back and I begin to examine these scenes in a different way um, before I get back to kind of that word by word, sentence by sentence polishing of this story that uh, I've been working on now for a little bit over a year. Um And uh, I'm starting to get to that point where I'm feeling not necessarily pressured to get it done, but maybe pressured is the right word, not from the outside, but definitely from inside. I have other stories out there I want to tell, and I want to get this one nailed down and finished so I can try to get it out there in the world. So uh, I think that was a very, very long real-time revision. If you've hung with me for that, thank you so, so much. As always, thank you for being a member of the Patreon team. If this was your first real-time revision, I promise not all of them are this long. Not all of them get quite this far into the weeds, but I felt like this was really valuable. And I'm trying to arrange to get um, Sean Coyne on a future podcast. Super busy guy, lots of requests, uh, but I'm going to keep hounding him and see if we can have him come on and answer some questions and talk to us about this uh, process. So anyway, we're going to leave it there because, uh, yeah, I'm tired of talking and you're tired of listening. So uh, I'm going to get back to doing some editing here and uh, I wish you luck on the writing that you're doing. Thanks. Bye-bye.